a manger and his life was made to be taken away upon death's cruel tree he became sin's atonement for sinners as i am upon the cross of calvary died mary's little lamb mary had a little lamb little lamb little lamb mary had a little lamb he washed us white as snow and he washes all our sins away sins away sins away washes all our sins away in calvary's crimson flow sent into this world and now his work's already been done he's ascended to the throne and there intercedes for every son and he is soon returning just as his father planned in strength and power and glory will come mary's little lamb mary had a little lamb little lamb little lamb mary had a little lamb he washed us white as snow and he washes all our sins away sins away sins away he washes all our sins away in calvary's crimson Take your Bibles, turn with me please to the book of Romans, chapter number 1, Romans chapter 1, <clears throat> we're going to uh, uh, start a study, I, I'm not for sure how long it will go, but we're going to talk about uh, evidence for the existence of of God. We live in a time when there are so many folks who doubt that there's a God. Not only doubt, but they uh, uh, make great swelling um, comments that there is no God, as if they know all things. I think that uh, an honest human would never profess to be an atheist maybe an agnostic, that is, that I don't know uh, that there is a God. Now, I know that there's God because I have personally experienced His grace, and through His Word, I've come to know Him as a comforter, as my Redeemer. And I'll tell you, there was nothing in this world that could fix me except the Lord Jesus Christ. I sought for peace for most of my young adult life. And I sought peace in anything and everything that I had recommended. And nothing gave me peace. I was constantly in turmoil. And I had no purpose. I had no higher standard uh, of life and uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ uh, saved my soul my whole life took on a purpose and a meaning so the reason that I want to do this is maybe there'll be folks out there that, that maybe don't believe in God but would listen to what I say and God might do something and then for those of you that deal with people who may uh, flaunt their disbelief. Maybe it'll give you some ideas about how to talk with them and pray for them. The Bible tells us here in the book of Romans, chapter 1, we'll start reading for time's sake at the 19th verse. And the Bible says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it un." To them. Now, the book of Romans is a, a very 
complicated book and it has many deep and dark mysteries. And one of the things that Paul touches on here is that within the heart of man and through his reasoning and through his conscience, man is aware that there is a divine creator. Now, the, the, way, the reason I say this is that in every culture, uh, when I had uh, all of the different anthropology classes in college, and we studied ancient religions and religions of the world, uh, every, every country, every society of people that we know of that have ever existed for any period of time believed in a god. Now, they may have believed in many gods, which is called polytheism, but they always believed that there was a divine creator. They saw him in the lightning storms. They saw him in the various things that occurred, tornadoes and hurricanes and and they saw him in earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and just about everything that you can fathom. Even on an island out in the Pacific, uh, they found a group of people that at one time may have had about 10,000 people and they had erected statues uh, from stone and these huge stone statues and as they excavated into what these people believed, they uh, realized that what they were doing was a type of worship uh, to their gods and to the, the ones that they believed in. Now, man cannot rightly understand who God is, but he knows from what we see here that there is a God, for it says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. From the time you're uh, able to reason and think as you come into the world, uh, you're aware that there is someone who is much bigger than us, much smarter than us, who has created this world. We know that uh, the, uh, the fusion of man's uh, DNA, and when they look at primates and they look at human beings, that human beings have fused DNA that makes all the difference. Where did that fusing come from? It came from God. Because man is different from any of the creatures that walk the earth because man can worship and man has the ability uh, to sing and to praise God in unique ways. And then he says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Notice he says the invisible things like gravity. Gravity is invisible, but it is clearly seen. Jump off of a house sometime, and you'll clearly see gravity. Uh, there are all types of electric, electric fields and electric currents. We don't know how this heart beats right here. has no battery, has no solar uh, connected to it, no gasoline, but it beats, and it beats, and it beats, and it beats, and it keeps us alive. And yet, we cannot see the power that God uses to keep us alive. He goes on and says these are, are clearly seen from the creation of the world. I have a good friend who sent me uh, some pictures. He's got a, a huge telescope. And he takes pictures of the moon, and Venus, and Mars, and, and he sends me pictures all the time. And, and it's amazing, you know, these, 
these uh, things out in our solar system. And I was reading an article, this, uh, this man who once was an atheist, who's now a Christian, and he said that one of the factors that caused him to be a Christian was that he studied the sun. And when he noted how precise the sun was set from the earth, and he, he did all kinds of calculations and things that most people would never even dream of. And he said when he did that, it made him realize that the sun had to be placed in the very precise place to sustain life. If it had been just a degree closer, the earth would be too hot and we couldn't live. Were it a degree further away, it would be too cold. But it's just perfect. And we could talk about the atmosphere, how God has mixed everything in the gases of the atmosphere so that we can breathe oxygen and live. Uh, there, there are thousands of things that are clearly seen being, being understood by the things that are made. Even His eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. I have an atheist friend, and I've been friends with him for a number of years. And about every week I text him, and I will sometimes send him a Bible verse. Sometimes I'll just ask him how he's doing. But no matter what I say, no matter how positive it is, he will always come back with some negative, hurtful saying. Always. Not one time has he ever said anything that is neutral or complimentary. And I told him once, I said, you know, I really, I really find it hard to believe that within you that there is not even one little glimpse of anything good or positive in your life. Now, why he still allows me to be his friend, I don't know, but evidently God is, has created some kind of curiosity with him, but I do love him, and I do pray for him, and I, I do try my best, and, and I hope that before I die, I get to see the man come to faith in Christ. But he says, they're without excuse all you have to do is look up if you've got eyes. If you don't have eyes, all you have to do is think with your mind that there is a Creator, there is a God. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And uh, the reason that this is singular is uh, showing us that each heart of each man individually is corrupt and he is vain in his imagination and he has a foolish heart, professing themselves to be wise. Now, uh, this gentleman that I talked to, he thinks he's very wise. And uh, there are a few things that he's, you know, he has uh, several degrees and uh, he's done a lot of things in his life and, and he really thinks he's wise. But when it comes to simple elementary things, he's a fool. And here he says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God unto an image made like to corruptible man. You know, like uh, making a statue or, or erecting something and calling it God. You know, painting a picture on the wall uh, and, and saying that's Jesus. When, when nobody knows what Jesus looked like except for the catacombs, which were done in the first century. And in the catacombs, they have these carvings of Jesus. And he had short cropped hair. He wasn't like the Michelangelo picture, you know, with this long flowing hair and all that kind of stuff. 
That's not the way the catacombs portray him. Now, my question to Michelangelo, uh, being as intelligent as he was, why would he draw a picture of his imagination when he could have gone back to history and seen some of the pictures of catacombs where they had carvings of who Jesus looked like? And he was just a common, ordinary man with a, with a very short beard and with short cropped hair. Of course, they couldn't go into a lot of detail, but uh, many believe that this is the most accurate uh, things that we can look at to say what he may have looked like. But it says that uh, they turned it into four-footed beast. You know, you, you see these uh, drawings of, of a horse with a man's head. And they, they turn that into some kind of a god. Or you see uh, something that looks like a, a bull, and it's got human, got female breast, and uh, it's got horns and all that stuff. Uh, many worship that god, which is Satan. And wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. You know, when you don't believe that there's a God, you become more and more corrupt. Look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And then if you look at verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God that they which Commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure. Uh, they have pleasure. They have, uh, they have uh, consent to it. I mean, it's something they do, and they delight in that. And them that do them. And then if you look over to chapter 2 and verse 15, uh, the Bible says there, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. These verses assert that God has worked this great truth into the very wool and warp of every man's being. It's woven into the very fabric of his being that nowhere is he without this witness. The preacher may safely follow the example of the Bible in assuming that there is a God. You know, uh, one of the things that we taught and were taught in theology was that God never tries to prove that He's God. He simply makes the statement. It's a declaration. The Bible tells us in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. It didn't argue for His existence or tell you why He's in existence. It simply states it as a fact. And God created the heaven and the earth. Not the heavens, but the heaven and the earth. And so, throughout the Word of God, this assumption is made. We see that He must unhesitantly and explicitly assert, as the Scriptures do, that His eternal power and His eternal divine nature are things that are clearly seen and perceived in the evidences of the handiwork that abound everywhere you look. If you look down at the ground, you take a shovel and you start digging. You start finding treasures. Now, it may not be gold or silver or diamonds, but you find a worm. And you take a little red worm and 
You lay it out on the ground, and you watch it wiggle and turn, and, and you realize that that creature uh, did not just happen, that it has all of these various uh, things that it was created with to allow it to burrow through the dirt and get the nutrients it needs from the dirt and then pass it through its body. It has the slime and everything on it so that the dirt will not stick to it and cause it to be frozen. And all of that, God has made that creature specifically so it can do those things. If you look at the water, the more we look at the oceans, we look at the coral reefs, and we look at the different fish, and we look at all the creatures that inhabit the oceans. Or if you look into the sky and you see the birds and all of those uh, different creatures that God made to fly, we see His handiwork all around us. The nature of God versus agnosticism is uh, clearly... Uh, in my opinion, a, a very clear argument. Uh, God is spiritual. God is not material. For the Bible tells us, this was one of the questions that uh, uh, Brother Jim Jeffries, who questioned me in my ordination, he, uh, he said uh, to me, he said, Tony, what is God? And uh, I said, God is a spirit. And he said, well, explain that. And so I had memorized John chapter 4 and verse 24. And there it says that God is a spirit. And notice it's capitalized. God is a spirit. And we get the word pneuma, breath. Uh, in this case, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. And they that worship Him must worship Him. Now notice this. The Spirit here is small. And that's talking about the Spirit of man. Must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You don't worship God with your flesh. The flesh is incapable of comprehending God and worshiping Him appropriately. That's why we are spiritual beings when we are born again. We worship Him in spirit and truth. So what is God? God is a spirit. And you must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the woman saith unto Him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when He has come, He will tell us all things. You see, she had evidently already read in the Psalms, she had read Genesis chapter 3, where Christ was promised that He would come. She had read the prophecies of Isaiah, and she knew that Messiah was going to come. And she said, when He comes, He'll be called the Christ. What does that mean? Well, the word Christos means the anointed one. Whenever they would uh, select a king, they would anoint him. They would pour the holy oil over him, and he would be anointed as the king. We are, as his children, called to worship in our spirit. And she said, he will be the Christ, that's whom uh, we will know, and when He has come, He will tell us all things. That is, He will make the Old Testament come to life. He will explain His purpose and His mission. And that's what He did while He was here upon the earth. He took those twelve, and while He was with them for about three and a half years, He taught them in parables. He taught them in object lessons. He taught them straight out doctrinal truth and everything that they needed in order 
to serve him. Now, the Samaritan's woman, her question was, well then where can we find God, basically? And then she says, are we going to find him on Mount Zion or, you know, where are we going to worship him? Notice she says, uh, verse 26, Jesus said to her, I that speak unto thee am he. And this is one of the only places where you find the Lord coming out and directly telling a person, I am the Christ. And literally, uh, the Greek here means, I am who I am. And he said, I that speak unto thee am who I am. I am he. And upon this came his disciples, and they marveled in all of that at uh, his uh, saying. And uh, the woman has already asked him, up in verse number uh, 22, she says, you worship, you know not what, or he does, and we know what we worship for salvation of the, is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship. You know, she thought that the only place you could worship would, uh, would be in this mountain or that mountain or at Jerusalem or some other place. And the Lord was telling her that it's not restricted to a single locality. That people all around the earth will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, God is not to be confined and cannot be confined by any of the limitations that man places upon Him. For He's God. How can spirit be contained? Uh, if you put it in a bottle, it's going to run the bottle over. If you put it into a, a bucket, it's going to fill it up and run over. Look at Acts 7 and verse number 48. The Bible says, How be it the Most High dwelleth not in the temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? You stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. He cannot be contained. And then when the Apostle Paul was preaching uh, in Acts 17, I believe there on Mars Hill, he said in chapter 17, verse 25, Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made, now notice, one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. You see this, this idea that we ought to run around talking about our race, you know, and all this stuff that separates us and divides us and causes all this animosity and hatred. We need to get beyond that stuff. Amen. All of these race baiters, and you've got all these, and many times a lot of them are these religious black leaders, whether it be Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton, and these guys have made millions of dollars off of race hatred. Now I know slavery was an awful thing, but there's nobody alive today who was a part of slavery. That was a part of our history, and it has already been done, and it is over. Now, I know it, that we don't want to forget history, but we should not be making race some big divisive issue. We're all human beings. 
whether you're Hispanic, black, Chinese, African, whatever, we're human beings. We're, like one man said, we're one race, the human race. And it's high time that we start living that way and people start seeing people without colors and without nationalities and race. For he says, God has made all men of one blood. One blood. So whether you're black or white, in fact, I know this is a fact. When my father was blown up at the age of 21, he was working for the power company, and he was running a jackhammer and hitting on a, a load of dynamite. And it blew one of my dad's legs off and blew about 30% of his other leg off. He was blown about 40 feet into the air. He was down in a hole about 15 feet. He blew in the air, fell on the side of the hole, and then fell down into the hole. And my dad needed blood. And they put out a, uh, an announcement all through the, the area of Owsley and Breathitt and Lee and Wolf for people to come to the Onita Hospital and give blood to my dad or he would not live. One of my grandpa's friends was a black man. And that man gave more blood to my dad than any other person that gave blood. According to my dad, that man came as many times as he could. I don't know how many transfusions they had to do on my dad to keep him alive. And, uh, you know, I used to think, well, you know, Dad, so you mean I've got black blood in me? And he said, no, son, because you know, he was a human being and his blood was the same type as mine and he gave me blood. He loved me enough that he would do that. Now, you know, I love people a whole lot, but I don't know if I love people enough to give them my blood because I can't handle these needles. I mean, I've got a port here because I don't have no veins. I mean, but uh, anyway, you got to love somebody a whole lot to just come back and give them blood and give them blood and give them blood to keep them alive. But all, God has made all men of one blood, so it don't matter about nationality. We need to promote that. We need to encourage that. We see this is also repeated in 1 Kings 8, 27. Uh, we don't have time to go and, and deal with that, but you can write that down and, and look at it. And God is to be worshipped in spirit, and this is distinguished from all place and all form and all of the other sensual limitations of man. Truth as distinguished from any false concepts resulting from an imperfect knowledge of God. You see, when we don't worship in truth, then we come up with a strange form of God. We come up with four-footed Creatures, and we come up with beasts and all sorts of wild things. And we know what people have worshipped down through the centuries. And the Bible teaches us that God is light, God is spirit. We see this through the scriptures. And I'd like you, uh, I'd like you to look with me. I know you all are getting pretty tired. Some of you are about to fall asleep on me. Uh, so I'm not going to... I'm going to keep you all day, but I could probably preach another hour if I, you know, but I won't do that to you. Uh, a preacher, it's hard for a preacher to quit preaching because you love to preach. But anyway, I think this, this will be a blessing to you. I was reading this uh, earlier in the week. In Luke 24, uh, there is a, a passage where Jesus talks to his disciples about who he was. And this is something we need to understand. And uh, in verse, let's start in verse number, uh, in Luke 24, 
and verse number 39. Luke 24 and verse number 39. The Bible says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me. Touch me. Handle me. And see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. When Christ was resurrected, He had a new glorified body. And you could touch Him. He was there with them. They even looked at His side and saw where the spear had been thrust. They saw the scars in His hands. And here He says, Touch me. Handle me. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones. And when, when He had thus spoken, He showed them His hands and His feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, He said unto them, Have you here any meat? So, He's going to... It's not that He's hungry. But He wants to show them that He can consume food. And the Bible says that... Uh, they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb. Now, you know, I've got I've been working on a sermon about the foods of the Bible. And while I tell you what, uh, uh, food can be a killer. I had to learn this the hard way. And it took me about 63 years of my life and you know, all things work together for good to them that love God. And I went through a whole lot, 25 years of awful pain and suffering because I did not know what I could eat safely. You remember what John the Baptist ate? John the Baptist, Jesus said, of all men born of woman, there's none greater than John the Baptist. And he came eating locusts or grasshoppers and wild honey. That's all he ate. It says that he, was, he did not have the delicacies of the rich and all these others, but all he could do, he could have a lifestyle that did not cause him to have to spend a bunch of money and he wouldn't be dependent upon others. He would go out and he would catch grasshoppers. Now, I don't know if he dried them. I don't know if he cooked them on a fire. I don't know what he did. But the Bible clearly tells us that's what he ate. And he evidently did very well on it. Eating simply protein with a little honey to give it flavor. Now here Jesus ate broiled fish. That means that it was cooked over an open fire and he ate a little honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled that was written in the law of Moses and the prophets, the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. So he revealed to them that he was God in flesh. And after his death, he had a resurrected, glorified body. Brother Chapman led us in a song this morning. And it's the first time it ever happened to me. But he led us in a song, and, and in that last verse, there was a word picture of a, a man in a ship. And he was talking about the time will come when we will anchor fast on that heavenly shore, the storms all past forevermore. Amen. And in that moment when, when we sung that, I was transported in a vision in my mind. I could just see that man who had been out on the ocean for weeks and weeks and faced the storms of life. But now finally, He's anchored in the heavenly shore with the storms all past forevermore. Amen. And our Redeemer brought that for us. 
He is the image, Colossians 1.15, of the invisible God. And we'll close with this final thought in 1 Timothy 1.17. There it says, now unto the king. It tells us that he is eternal, immortal. He's the only wise God. He's the potentate. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. These passages teach that God has nothing of a material or bodily nature. Sight sees only objects by the material world. But God is not of the nature of the material world. He cannot be seen with the material eye, at least not now. But a day will come when these bodies are going to be delivered from this flesh and this corruption must put on incorruption and then shall be brought to pass the saying that death is swallowed in victory the evidence for the existence of God really to me it's overwhelming I've always believed there was a God when I was a little bitty boy uh I one time got sick and I had a fever. Now, according to my mom, my grandmother was 107. Can you believe that? 107. And my mom thought I was going to die. And she took me to my grandmother. And my grandmother was a woman of prayer. And she told, has told me the story so many times, I can still see it in my mind. Somehow I remember being reached over a fence. My grandma and grandpa had a fence around their house. And my mom was crying and she reached me over to my grandma. I was, I was maybe four or five years old. But I had a terrible fever and I was, I was so sick. And I remember my grandma taking me in. And my mom came in then. And my grandma and grandpa. My grandpa wasn't a saved man but. My grandma got on her knees and she started praying. And she started begging God. Oh God, touch my little grandson. Lord, let him live. Don't take him, God. And mom says that within 30 minutes, I was up running in the yard playing and my fever had left me. As a little boy, I knew that somebody, something had touched me. And I knew that God was there. I never saw God with my eyes. But I felt Him in my heart. And I felt His presence all around me. And the day that He saved me, God became real to me. I I developed a relationship. And every morning when I wake, my first thoughts are about God. And the last thing on my mind before I lay down to rest is God. God fills our thoughts. He fills our hearts because He is. He lives. Heavenly Father, thank You for all the evidences of truth in Your Word for the fact that one day we're going to lay aside these bodies. You've told us that we're going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the trump of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Fill our hearts and minds, Lord, with this true understanding of who you are and what you are. That we may know you more. That we may know the fellowship of your suffering and the power of your resurrection. In Jesus' name. Amen.